हम कते नमो तथा भगवत अरहतु समूत नमो तथा भगवत अरहत समूत नमो तथा भगवत अरहत समूत भूत नम संगंग नमस्म So we've come to uh <clears throat> what Buddha Dhamma Forest Monastery to practice meditation <clears throat> and in in Thailand they forest tradition is actually referred to as the uh, in Thai Tudong Kamatan which translates roughly as uh, ascetic meditation tradition so if you come here for ascetic meditation or fun meditation <laughs> partly it's sort of to give a a designation of what kind of meditation to expect uh especially tomorrow morning when it's cold and <laughs> 4 a.m. <laughs> then you know what asceticism is <laughs> especially if you're not in a, in a non-heated building <clears throat> but when we come to the west yeah because uh well, partly because asceticism doesn't sell so well in the west <laughs> we just say forest <laughs> forest tradition <clears throat> and those in the know will get the get the idea you know living in living in the forest requires a certain amount of simplicity <clears throat> and that's as one side of asceticism and simplicity that's, that's the easy side you know it's a, basically you know meditation practice generally requires some degree of time and energy so if we have a simple lifestyle we have more time and energy for meditation right logical people like logical answers in the west <laughs> <clears throat> the other side of it is maybe the not so pleasant side is that for many of us don't realize just how much uh our sense of self is contained within its familiar comfort zone you know we build around ourselves a reasonably comfortable environment i mean it's i think you got to be a masochist to live in an uncomfortable environment or be sometimes you're thrown into it but then this sense of self is sort of sheltered buffered as it were within that comfort zone and uh, you know sort of asceticism in its traditional religious sense is designed that it kind of pushes out of that comfort zone so that our self gets a little bit rubbed up the wrong way so you get a a sense of what it is you know we we are also our our sense of self has these say what do you say limitations you know greed aversion delusion <laughs> and they are also or many times are buffered by our comfort zone you live with people who support you and pat you on the back say you're wonderful right but maybe not not at work sometimes but <laughs> you choose your friends wisely who are going to say you're wonderful right <laughs> <clears throat> so you don't face too many challenges or disagreements you know you live in a world which is 
you know, it lives up to your expectations as far as physical comfort goes. You're not hungry or tired uh, most of the time. Yeah, but then our sense of self doesn't really get exposed. But when you challenge it a little bit, push outside the comfort zone, then you start might hear, hear the screaming. <laughs> I don't like this. I don't want that. <laughs> Who's screaming? Uh, there's your sense of self. Huh? Yeah, I am screaming. Yeah, my sense of self is screaming. <clears throat> so it gets exposed. But you need to be somewhat alert to recognize that too. I mean, maybe some people practice asceticism out of a sense of, I don't know, guilt or something, or self-disparagement. Not with wisdom. They don't do it with wisdom. That's why meditation is also part of this formula. Ascetic meditation practice. <clears throat> so in meditation practice, in Buddhism, I mean, kamatana is the general term for, for mental development or practice, spiritual practice in Buddhism. It literally means kind of the sphere of action, kama, karma. See. So the sphere of action in meditation is two, two sides to it. We call it samatha vipassana, calm and insight. And uh, while there are some traditions, they kind of, maybe they have their name as more like samatha or more vipassana maybe. But in the scriptures, the Buddha talked about both of them together. They're usually used, you know, in the, they're usually quoted together in the scriptures as far as meditation goes. Calm insight. <clears throat> and they, you know, there's, there's different ways you can practice it. You know, some teachers emphasize quite a bit of calm meditation. In fact, the, many of the forest meditation masters in Thailand, they usually emphasize a lot of concentration first. But it's, it's possible to then, the Buddha said, in the scriptures it says, you can do calm and then insight, or insight and then calm, or both together. So, take your pick. <laughs> but they have to go together, see, in order for it to realize liberation completely. Complete liberation. <clears throat> <clears throat> there were stories of people who just heard one discourse of the Buddha and realized the first level of awakening. And many of them were not, didn't, they weren't meditators. Yeah, they just were, you can imagine, I think I mentioned last time about how if the Buddha was, you know, the Buddha was teaching, he probably had a lot of attention on him, you see. He had a great charisma, so he attracted your attention. So you probably had an innate concentration then. And then he, then he was a very good speaker, so you had a lot of awareness too, mindfulness. So this, this sounds interesting. You could lead people on carefully. They, they call it the progressive teaching, see. Stage by step by step. So people were drawn into it. So you can imagine they had, we can say they had calm and insight if you like, <laughs> initially anyway. <clears throat> but for most people, we aren't so fortunate to be around in the Buddhist time. Yeah? We missed it, I'm sorry. <laughs> we're too late. <laughs> Maybe next time. <laughs> if, 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 you're, if, if you practice well enough, <laughs> but don't hold your breath so <clears throat> on that one. But normally we follow the you know calm and insight practice either. And uh, I think it, I think personally it's a matter of personality. Some people you can say you know simplifying it a little bit, they are maybe a little bit more uh, busy busy minded, a little bit more intellectual, or they have a more discursive thought. So perhaps for them, concentration is very hard. You try concentration meditation, sabata, uh, calm meditation, and it's just it's hopeless. But they, because their mind is active, they could reflect or contemplate much more easier. Other people have a moral tendency towards concentration. You know, they say that the faith temperament of person, personality, is very good at concentration. <clears throat> So they, they find it quite easy, well, you know, relatively easy. You know. <clears throat> when I, I've been teaching in the West for many, many years, and, well, I won't judge you, but generally speaking, <laughs> many people in the West do not have a lot of co easy concentration. 
natural concentration. Just the very fact of, you know, so much education and having to think so much, it's, it's been hard to have deep concentration. But there are some people who do. Yeah, some, some of the interviews I gave on, on, on retreats. There was one man I remember, he, was, uh, he came for the interview and he was saying how he could focus his mind very easily and very sharply. And, and I just asked him, what's your job? He said, I'm a television repairman. That was in the old days when you could repair them. <laughs> so he spent all day focusing on little, on little wires in, these, in his television set, you see. So he developed naturally a concentration just by his job, you see. He had to pay very, very close attention. If you got the wrong wires crossed, you might get electrocuted, you see. <laughs> or at least wreck the television anyway, rather than fix it. <clears throat> Somebody else, you know, they're, they're telling me how they could, they could observe in, the, in a walking meditation. In a walking meditation, you also pay attention to the sensation of feet touching the ground, you see. And they said they can be aware of, of every single bone in the foot moving. 26 bones in the foot, right? Right? You don't know. <laughs> I thought you were a nurse. <laughs> I didn't know either, but she told me the 26 bones in your foot. And she could be aware of every single bone moving, you see. <laughs> because she was a physiotherapist. <laughs> so of course she has to be aware of those things. Yeah. Not something that I have to be aware of, except that I break my foot maybe or something. <laughs> But she trained her mind, she had to train her mind for her job to be able to be aware of every movement, you see. <coughs> so we shouldn't have a talent for it, but she trained her mind that way, you see. So depending upon your, you know, personality, how you develop your personality, your, your livelihood, your education, whatever, you know, you might be inclined towards concentration or towards vipassana or contemplation. But it, it doesn't really matter so much, <clears throat> but that we do, we develop them together, you know. And basically, again, simplifying it somewhat, the, the samatha or calm meditation, the main quality of mind necessary or developed is concentration or, or focused attention. Just like the very basic exercise, focusing on the breathing. Okay? And for developing insight meditation, vipassana, the most important factor is mindfulness. To be develop awareness or mindfulness, <coughs> and just as, and and for for meditation practice, of course, both of these are, have to be used. If you haven't got enough concentration, then you can't see very clearly what's going on in your mind. And if you if you don't have enough awareness, then you don't know where your concentration is. Your mind is concentrated or not. But it depends which one you emphasize. So I say, I give the analogy of just like, you know, the hand has two sides to it, you know. Depends which side you want to emphasize. So we take up the exercise of focusing on breathing, <coughs> and you notice your, your mind is wandering, wandering, wandering. Well, if you just bring up maybe some more awareness, you know, what is your mind doing? You know, what kind of distraction is it? And maybe you notice, so oh, I'm thinking about the past. Say, well, why do that? It's already past, right? Why waste your mental energy thinking about the past when it's already finished? Oh, okay, drop it. Then you can go back to the breathing much easier. Maybe the, the habit keeps returning, but at least you have the wisdom to know, hey, this is a wasted effort here. You know, I mean, before, before I learned meditation, I didn't know that you know, just daydreaming was, 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 uh, wasn't much useful, that it was very useful. You know, I could miss my classes off just by daydreaming, you know. Miss all the worries in life, just daydream away. <laughs> <coughs> However, <coughs> fortunately I came across a book on Buddhism, and this, this book, I, I can't remember too much about it, but one of the statements I remember is, it just said, uh, there's no, the past is already gone, the future hasn't come, it's only the present moment. And 
I was studying science. I said, of course, only the present moment exists, right? Where's the past? It's in here, in the, in the present moment. The, the past is in the present moment in your mind right now, isn't it? The future is in your mind right now. Just an idea in your mind right now. So there isn't a past over there and a future over there. It's all happening right now. So I said, well, yeah, I can agree with that. I looked at my own mind to check out if I was in the present moment, and I realized I was hardly ever in the present moment. <laughs> Dreaming in the past, planning the future. <laughs> so I said, wait, wait a minute. I'm wasting my life, you know. So come back to the present moment. Yeah, right. For one second and then off to the future again. Well, back to the past again. Just, wow, this is harder work than I thought. <laughs> so I realized that Buddhism was helpful, but hard work. <laughs> so <laughs> I needed some help. <laughs> But nowadays, we, have, we do have access to uh, many teachings, Buddhist teachings. <clears throat> so we don't all, don't all have to go off to Asia to look for a teacher. When I was learning meditation 50 years ago, that was the only option. You know, I had to go off to Asia, find a teacher. But uh, nowadays, you can, you know, was it Ajahn Google, isn't it? <laughs> 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 Mindfulness. <laughs> the trouble is, <laughs> I gave a talk in New Zealand and I said about something about meditation, lots of kinds of meditation practice. So one, and then I, I, I said, you can probably you know, check it on the internet. So one time I was at the office and I thought, maybe I'll just try that, you know, meditation, Buddhist meditation. <laughs> like a hundred thousand <laughs> choices. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, the top one, <laughs> which I read, was not the best one. <laughs> it wasn't too bad for the average person, I guess, but it was very user-friendly. <laughs> but it wasn't the correct one. <laughs> of course, mine is the correct one, but... <laughs> I don't think I'm on Google yet, but <laughs> who knows? maybe I should try that too, shouldn't I? <laughs> but I, I put my my trust in the the, the Buddhist teaching that's recorded in the Pali Canon. So you know, so the Buddha talks about calm and insight, even though there are you know so-called vipassana traditions, and you know there's a, there's different groups that say they are samatha practice. So you know they they have part of the picture. They're not wrong, but they only have part of the picture. We would have talked about both of them together. <clears throat> so we start off with, say, taking up, <clears throat> say, for example, most people start off with focusing on breathing. <clears throat> <clears throat> so you can use that as, a, as, a, as an exercise in developing focused attention on breathing, or you can use it as an exercise in insight meditation. Being aware of the breath arising, passing away, arising, passing away. So, so you know, first of all, do you want to you need to emphasize calmness of mind. Is your mind too busy to observe anything? Then maybe you have to give some emphasis to focusing attention, focusing attention. And it's helpful to have one object. When there's one object, another translation of concentration is one pointedness, ekagata one-pointedness of mind. So you have one object to keep focusing on. And if you keep up with it, if you, if you maintain that focusing enough, even though in the beginning it might be very, very difficult, <clears throat> but you develop it enough, you begin to train your mind to settle on this one object. You have to be a little bit careful not to get too obsessive about it, not to try and push away distractions. Just go back to the breathing. I say gently, patiently, back to the breathing, back to the breathing, back to the breathing. Eventually your mind gets tired of playing all these tricks and it <laughs> begins to settle down. But you can't say when. This could be hours, could be days, could be weeks, could be years. <laughs> but it's all good anyway. <laughs> 
At the very least, you know, you can observe, you know, the tendencies that the mind gets up to. You know, it sounds like a very simple thing, just focus on breathing, but that's only, again, it's only part of the picture. The, the insight part is observing what your mind is doing besides breathing, aware, being aware of breathing. So you're aware of, you know, trying, to be, trying to be aware of breathing and the mind goes off to the past or the future. Uh, you can observe that. There's insight meditation already. Back to breathing again. There's, there's, there's calm meditation for a little while. Mind goes off again. If you can observe that, there's insight meditation. Then you support each other. If you, if you can see through some of the, the tricks the mind plays, then you just don't take it so seriously anymore. Yeah, the mind goes up to these various tricks. And say, okay, I see you. Yeah, there's a very good uh, well, an, kind of analogy, I guess, given in the Buddhist scriptures. They sometimes they say that uh, you know they they give the uh, the personification of Mara. Mara is the tempter. It also is short for for death. Yeah. Rather than the deathless, Mara is the death. Dying again and again and again. So the Mara. Sometimes it was there was these stories that mentioned about Mara attacking somebody. See? Like he, he attacked the Buddha many times. All the Buddha had to do was just say, "Oh, aha, Mara, I see you." All he had to do was be aware of Mara, and Mara up. The game, the game is up, and disappears. He didn't have to fight Mara. Didn't need to fight with him, struggle with him. Your mind goes, starts, starts to get caught into confusion. You know, don't need to fight with it. Just say, oh, there's confusion. Okay? Once you, have, once you recognize confusion, it, it's not confusion anymore, is it? If you know confusion, you're wise to confusion. So, okay, maybe it's still confusion 90%. <laughs> <clears throat> but you're 10% ahead of the game, right? <laughs> the next time, hopefully, you'll be on, on, on your alert to catch it quicker. See? You'll see confusion a bit more quicker. And it's only 80% dominant, and then 70%. And then, you know, this, I can, you know, this, hopefully, this isn't just, maybe this might just be half an hour, but it could be half a lifetime. But <laughs> time is irrelevant when it comes to meditation practice. You see? <laughs> <clears throat> But some people only hear, maybe they only hear, you know, half of the story. Like they only hear about just focusing on breathing. You know, and then they spend the next 20 years just focusing on breathing. And it does some benefit, but, you know, they aren't recognizing the full picture, calm and insight. And the insight meditation, I mean, this is, <laughs> in, in a way, calm meditation is... is Easy, easy in principle, but difficult in practice. Yeah, calmness of mind, very simple, one-pointed. What's more simple than one, huh? <laughs> but try and do it. How often is your mind one-pointed? Huh? <laughs> how, many, how many milliseconds is your mind one-pointed? <laughs> We're insight meditation, yeah, it's a little bit more complex, but in a way it's easy, you know, because we all have awareness to some degree. But many of us don't see very clearly. We, we have some degree, of, some degree of awareness, but not clear awareness. Like mindfulness, full presence of mind, yeah, is clear mindfulness, clear, clear awareness, <clears throat> which can be supported to some degree by calming the mind down. When the mind is a bit calmer, you can notice what some of the things that are happening in the mind. You can see thoughts arising and passing away, rather than shoo, I thought there was a thought there. It might have been a thought. Well, <laughs> <clears throat> and then the Buddha gives these, these steps to follow in developing mindfulness, starting off with the body awareness, being aware of the body, and that's, for many people, I mean, that's a little bit more coarse, the body, sensation, you know, and you're aware of the body anyway to some degree, you know, but how many people give it much attention? 
much conscious attention. Most of us are so busy, occupied by our mind, that we just kind of, you know, put up with the body, as it were. But they actually bring attention to the body, observing its particular sensations, especially when they're a little bit on the unpleasant side. And then there's feelings. Again, it's a little bit tricky, the language problem a bit. You know, we usually think of feelings as emotion, but the Buddha keeps it very simple, basic, just pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. Very simple. Yeah. Well, in, th in theory, anyway. You know. Whereas, I mean, we, it's hard for us maybe to distinguish. You know, we're usually off when, when there is a pleasant feeling. It starts off until it be we don't notice it until it becomes, I don't know, joy or ecstasy or something. Huh? Yeah. But can you notice just when a, the, the basic change from unpleasant or neutral to pleasant. Hmm? It's all right, it's okay, pleasant. Hmm? Now it goes back again to unpleasant. Yeah. So it could be a, a whole area of investigation. And this is, this is very important because we all have feeling. But you know what, how you're feeling? Really? Yeah. How many times people have asked you, how are you feeling? You always got to say, fine, right? <laughs> if you say, well, not so fine today, you say, well, okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Go tell somebody else. <laughs> Go pay your therapist to talk about it. <laughs> but from, from feeling, other states of mind can arise, you see. If you don't notice unpleasant feeling building up, it can become aversion. If you, know, if you don't notice pleasant feeling, you know, then it can become desire, longing, craving for it. We are, we are sentient beings, so we, we all have feelings and are influenced very much by feeling. This is what our main motivation in life is, actually, feelings. Now, when it comes to states of mind, it gets more interesting, <laughs> more variety. <laughs> but fortunately, again, the Buddha just gives us kind of basic, starting off with simple states of mind. You know, first of all, the, the ones which are the strongest, greed, aversion, delusion. And it's you know, easy to say, but can you really observe your greed? Just observe it without being pulled into it. Can you observe your aversion without reacting to it? Huh? <clears throat> so even though the instructions are quite basic or simple, but when it comes to the practice, you know, there's, a, there's a lot in there. There's a lot in these simple instructions when it comes to the practice. But again, if you go back to calm meditation, you know, one-pointedness, at the very least, it simplifies the mind. Uh, usually, the, what, what is calmed is our reactiveness to these experiences. Our, re our reactions, our memories about them. You know. So when the mind is somewhat calm, you can just observe these feelings arising, the states of mind arising, without getting spun off into all the reactions against them or for them or whatever. <clears throat> and once we have a, a certain degree of uh, familiarity with the practice, yeah, then it can be helpful to study about some of the Buddhist teachings. Yeah. This is the last category of developing mindfulness. These are called the Dhammas, kind of uh, various, you can say, phenomena. And the Buddha puts them into kind of categories, easy categories for us. Yeah, the, uh, one of them is the five hindrances. You'll be able to observe the five hindrances. And if you observe something like aversion, for example, you know, I mean, you don't probably don't have to be told that's an aver that's a that's a hindrance, is, do you? Aversion's a hindrance. <laughs> but if you know what it, you know, you, you put it in that category of a hindrance, the Buddha also gives us ways to deal with it. You know, if you have a, if you recognize aversion, uh, for some people it may be a deeply rooted you know, personality reaction, aversion, for example. If it's a really, really strong reaction, 
The Buddha gives us another meditation practice to use called metta, friendliness. You know, there usually is a certain trigger to that, that aversion. Yeah? You try and be more open and friendly to it. Yeah? So it allows you to, rather than, you know, we, some people they have aversion and then they have aversion to the aversion. And aversion to the aversion to the aversion to the aversion and oh, long story. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your life. <laughs> but if you can turn it around, you know, there's aversion there, yes. Okay, now I'm trying to be a little bit more friendly to it rather than be averse to it. There is, you know, the possibility then to not amplify it at least. And the effect of friendliness is to come closer to it. You know, most of us, we're so averse to our aversion, we keep it at arm's length. So how are we ever going to see it? How are we ever going to understand it if it's way over there? I don't even want to come close to it. But if you can be more friendly to it, you know, depends on the degree of friendliness you can develop. You know, but it does po there's a possibility, first of all, it's non-contention. You don't fight with it. Okay? Yeah, aversion's there, okay, yes, let's, let's be friends. I'm practicing friendliness, right? <laughs> so we won't fight anyway. Yeah. But if you develop it further, you can even become friends with aversion. Can you imagine that? Doesn't mean you have to like it or love it, but it's, it's, it's a reality, so let's, let's be friends. And what do you do with friends? You get to know them, right? Come closer to them. So, so your, your aversion, you can say, oh, hello there, aversion. So, what's your name? <laughs> How are you today? <laughs> Tell me your story. <laughs> Where do you come from? How were you born? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what's, the, what, what's the causes behind it? You know? <clears throat> and sometimes, of course, you know, <laughs> You have to be careful not to get carried away with the story because... <laughs> Speaking of stories, <laughs> it's about time now, isn't it? <laughs> so, so one example I, I had myself, <clears throat> I was on a retreat and uh, I, was, I was... Okay, the, I just arrived there and the first night, you know, I was sitting there and I'm just nodding off. Just, Okay, it must be jet lag, you know. I just flew from England, right? An hour away. <laughs> Second night, still nodding off. <laughs> okay, it must be the elevation. It's high up in the mountains, you know. <clears throat> and the third night, oh, still just a blank. <clears throat> so anyway, <laughs> then it was time for walking meditation. Yeah, so I was doing walking, <laughs> walking meditation. And I said, what is this anyway? You know, it's not jet lag, it's not the elevation, not the food, you know, what is it, you know? And then I just, then I noticed there was a big black hole, a black cloud in my head here. There was no clarity at all, just a big black cloud of dullness. Oh, what's that? We're up in the mountains, it's, the sun is shining in southern Spain. Where's the, where's the cloud come from? <laughs> Must be in my mind. <laughs> So then I tried to figure out what this, you know, what investigate, contemplate what this big black cloud was, you know. And then it, I, I just kind of opened to it, you know, try to be a bit more friendly towards it, open to it. That's another aspect of friendliness is openness. When you, when you feel friendly to somebody, you feel open and relaxed, right? So, so what is this, you know? And as I was just trying to observe it, suddenly it just hit me. It was, it was my responsibility demon. You know, here I was worrying about the monastery in England, and I was in Spain, up in the mountains. <laughs> but I had been the second monk at the monastery in England, and the second monk carries all the burden. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm the second monk. <laughs> The first one sits up on the seat and gives the inspiring talks, and the second one does all the work. <laughs> Keeps the monastery afloat. <laughs> so, so, 
So here I was on retreat and I just couldn't kind of give it up. You know, I, I was carrying this responsibility with me too. <clears throat> I was just manifesting like a big black cloud in my head. But it was so ridiculous. Here I was up in the mountains in Spain, no telephone, no email, nothing. We're totally out of contact with the rest of the world. So I just, so I just laughed at it. And it just poofed, it vanished before me, just disappeared. <laughs> if it was only that easy all the time, huh? <laughs> and the next morning I sat there, <laughs> radiant, <laughs> at least not falling asleep anyway. <laughs> so it does work, but <laughs> sometimes you have to, you know, you have to apply it to specific situations, you see. So, I mean, it's very easy to say, oh, yes, be friendly to your version, but, you know, but, but, but. Huh? And say, when I'm in a good mood, I might try it, but. <laughs> but you have to be a little bit, a little bit brave, too, as it were, because sometimes, you know, our aversion is so much part of ourselves, we don't want to lose it, right? Like my responsibility demon. I mean, it was really hard for me to say, don't, I couldn't, I couldn't say, don't be responsible, you know, because that's not, that's not me. <laughs> but, but then now I learned to communicate with my responsibility demon, you see. I can communicate with it now and say, okay, yes, you're doing your job, but give me a break. Or, <laughs> or, or, or you're doing your job, but too much, <laughs> you know, back off, <laughs> you know. Because responsibility, having responsibility is, you know, it is a, it is, can be a positive thing too. So you can't just go the other way and say, no, don't be responsible, be irresponsible. You know, you got to find the middle way there. But if you have a better relationship with it, then it, it doesn't become a monster. It doesn't become a demon then. You know, it can become a support actually to wake you up, keep you, keep you on your toes as it were. <clears throat> So, I mean, all of these, you can say, all of these so-called defilements, you know, we, sometimes we simplify them by saying, oh, they're defilements, they're, 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 they're negative things, you know, and usually think, okay, get rid of the negative things, okay? but it doesn't work that way. Trying to get rid of negative things is negative thought. Huh? <laughs> so, you're still caught in the tread, treadmill, aren't you? <clears throat> but you can be more, more friendly towards them, have better relationship with them, you can use them in a positive way, you know. So all of these so-called defilements, I can say, they're they're actually you know, great treasures. Hmm? Can you believe that? Your aversion is a great treasure, you know, if you can relate to it wisely. Yeah? The aver aversion is telling you something about yourself. See, Buddhists don't have aversion. Yeah, I, I, I presume. <laughs> Or, you know, or another way to look at it, and this was one of Ajahn Chah's teachings, it was a bit, a bit controversial. You may have to edit this later, but... <laughs> Special teaching. <laughs> one of Ajahn Chah's talks, that I heard him stay, actually, and I was recording it, actually. And then one time he just said, oh, he said, people usually think that arahants don't have any greed, aversion, delusion by definition in the scriptures, he, he said, but I think they do, he said. He said, but, <laughs> but they have enough mindfulness to observe them. When aversion arises, they, they observe it, it arises and it passes away. They don't grab it, they don't react to it, they just observe it as a state of mind. It rises and passes away. So it doesn't stick with them. There's no, no self that we're to stick to. But if you have aversion, usually there's a big I there, right? I hate, I have aversion. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine just being able to notice this as a state of mind arising? And when it arises, it also passes away. Yeah. And nobody grabs it. So Ajahn Chah had a different view, as it were, of our states of mind. And this was very, I found this a great revelation personally, you know, because... You know, there were these states of mind arising. 
So I think, well, I guess I can't be an hour hunt today. <laughs> and I try to get rid of it, you know, try and have some kind of idea of a, a pure mind or something, rather. Than but the point is, if you can observe these so-called defilements yeah, as just a state of mind arising, passing away, it's no longer a defilement, is it? It becomes a source of wisdom. Yeah? It becomes a very precious jewel rather than a, something to be got rid of and, and condemned. You know, it's, it's a source of wisdom then. Oh, that's how aversion manifests. Yeah, that's where it comes from. Yes, it comes from unpleasant feeling tone. Yes. So then it becomes a, a I can say, a source of wisdom rather than a source of, you know, aversion <laughs> or, or oppression or whatever. You know? <clears throat> so once one develops these meditation exercises, we start off with the exercises, you know, like trying to, trying to develop mindfulness or awareness of states of mind, for example. You know, in the beginning, it is just trying. You put your effort into it, you try to observe these different phenomena arising, passing away. You know. But after a while, you can begin to actually be present with them. Not that you're somebody trying to observe my defilements in the mind, there can be a presence there, yes. And no sense of a self meditating anymore. Uh, just this presence of mind. And then it's the so-called self, a sense of a self, kind of fades to the background. There's just this presence of mind. Yeah. Nobody being mindful, this presence of mind itself as a, as a particular phenomena unique to itself. <clears throat> But, of course, this is something to be realized. You know, it's hard to explain or hard to rationalize. Uh, but most of the time, it's kind of beyond our normal conceptual way of thinking. Uh, you know, aversion is good or bad. Uh, usually it's bad. Yeah. But just be able to observe it, complete, no plus or minus, not good or not bad. It just is a state of mind arising, passing away. No, no judgment about it. <clears throat> and you can imagine the kind of liberation in that. You know, no, nobody gets enlightened. Tough luck. <laughs> there just is enlightenment. <laughs> if you think you're getting enlightened, no, you, good luck. <laughs> it's a long, hard struggle. <laughs> But there is the, the awakening of the mind, you see, as a state of mind, <laughs> not as somebody doing it. <laughs> so developing this common insight, I mean, it's, for most people, it does go in stages. You know, they talk about also the, 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 uh, the practice and the fruit. You know, for example, you try to practice focusing on breathing, and maybe it takes a bit of a struggle for a while, and then you find the right approach, you know, and then your mind is calm. You have a, a direct experience of it. Yeah? Then you start to, to like it or worry about it, want to hang on to it, and your mind's not calm anymore. Oops, back to breathing again. <laughs> but you, you, guys, you learn in the process. It's a learning experience becomes part of your experience and just trying to theorize about it. Yeah. I mean, in some sense, calmness of mind is a natural state. Yeah. yeah, We just fill our mind up with all kinds of trivia, don't we? Yeah? Usually? Or is it just me? <laughs> I won't ask you, so keep it personal. <laughs> no, but <laughs> if you notice some of the stuff you're thinking about, huh? is it so great? So wonderful, same old story again and again. <laughs> but if you just turn your mind to the breath, to the silence, to the quiet, what's the problem? <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so then you can learn to abide there more and more often. Huh? 
just in the, in the, in the natural calm of the mind, the natural clarity of the mind. Yeah. Being aware of whatever is arising, you know, outside, inside. It arises, it passes away. You don't need to react to it. You don't need to like it or dislike it. it just is there. It just is the way it is. <clears throat> So the whole point of these exercises is to get the direct experience and then, you know, it's, 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 as it were, it's beyond words then. It's something we know for ourselves, and, and we say, okay, it's wisdom or something, but, you know, wisdom is knowing yourself, knowing directly yourself. And then it says in the scriptures too that when one is, has a, a glimpse of this, one is beyond the teacher then. Hmm? One has seen it for oneself, so before that we might need a teacher to guide us give us instructions and uh, support. But once we've seen it for ourselves, then a teacher is in a way superfluous, but we still respect that position, you know, they've given us the guidance, but uh, now we're beyond it. So hopefully you'll be able to step beyond the teacher, realize the teaching for yourself, and you will all be teachers. Huh? <laughs>